Okay, so tonight we're doing Tehillim Psalms chapter 119, towards the end, letters Ayn, Pei, and Sadi. So, Bezat Hashem, next week we'll hopefully we'll complete this chapter, the last four letters. This chapter is in somewhat a continuation of many ideas that he expressed in the past about the value of the Torah, how meaningful it is to the Jew, how it's a guide for our entire life, from the very beginning when we're young, till the very end, when we are senior citizens already. It's an important guide in many, many ways. It's not just a, a book of laws that teaches us how to conduct ourselves, but also in how to deal with problems in life as they arise. And I'm going to give you just one example, and then we'll continue. The rabbis tell us something very interesting in the Gemara. A hash berosho, whoever has a headache, ya sok batorah. The Gemara says, don't take Tylenol if you have a headache. Learn Torah. I'm not saying you shouldn't take Tylenol. I mean, you obviously want to take any medication to relieve your pain. But it's an interesting Gemara. How is it that if you have a headache, you should learn Torah? Torah is pressure. Pressure on the head, on the mind. It's analytical. How will that in any way relieve you of the pain that you have? When we are in pain, we don't want to study. We don't want to deal with something difficult or complex. It doesn't make that much sense. What did the rabbis mean that that is a good cure? So even though a hash perashu could mean other things as well other than headache, it could be that someone is stressed out, that someone is in agony about something, not necessarily a headache, right? It could be all kinds of things that are tormenting him. It could be all of that. Still, we need to understand how will the Torah help. So, when we read these chapters, especially the chapters that deal with Torah, we will get a feeling for what the Torah does. It happened to me several times that I was bothered by something, I was deep in thought. It wasn't a headache, but it was a stressful moment, let's say. And all of a sudden, somebody turned on the music. I said, wow, that made such a big change. It was good music, not Persian music. <laughs> it wasn't depressing, it was uplifting. And it changed the mood. It just did something to elevate the spirit, and we all know that, what music does. And in some ways, Torah does the same thing. First of all, some commentaries tell us that when you learn the Torah, it will distract you from that pain. You will forget about it. So that's the simple meaning. Learn Torah and you will be distracted and therefore the pain will go away. Obviously it depends where the pain is coming from. There's different kinds of headaches. But the point is still the same. The Torah does have some benefit even on the physical level because it's uplifting. It will allow us to focus better. In the same way that glasses allows you to focus and see sharper, the Torah all of a sudden will remind you of certain things. And what it reminds you of, or what it enables you to focus on, will help clear up whatever is not so clear in your, in your mind. So it, whether it's tension, whether it's stress, whether it's just a headache, it's very possible that the learning of the Torah at that moment will just clear everything away. And that is why there's a lot of emphasis in this chapter about the Torah, not just about the importance of it, but also what it does for us, what it did for David Melech. And he's sharing this with us. He says, take it from me, I try this. And it's definitely very, very effective in many ways. So, the reason why he wants to remind us of all of this is because unfortunately, in his days, and today even more, a lot of people just ignore it, don't respect it enough, don't care about it. So he emphasized this a lot, a lot, a lot. And you'll be surprised at how many pesukim, how many verses are dedicated to saying almost the same thing. But every pasuk has a slightly different message. So let's begin with letter Ein, which takes us to pasuk Kuf Kaf Aleph, 121. This is not per se about the Torah, but it has to do with the Mishpat, it has to do with the laws of the Torah, it has to do with judgment. I practice justice, he was a judge, in righteousness, tzedek. 
Leave me not to my oppressors. What does oppressors have to do with practicing tzedek? What exactly is he telling us here? So he's saying two important ideas here. He's talking about the importance of doing justice. You have to be just. As a judge, obviously, and we are judges too. We judge situations, we judge people all the time. It's not necessarily in a court, even though he's talking about a court, but this means in general we are always going to be judging different situations. And we have to be just, we have to be fair, we have to give the benefit of the doubt. So that is, of course, the right thing to do, to do what is correct. But you know what? There's also something called tzedek. Besides mishpat, Besides justice, there's something called tzedek. Tzedek is translated as righteousness. What does he have in mind over here about righteousness? He has in mind here peshara, compromise. The rabbis tell us something incredible, that one of the reasons the second temple was destroyed, al shedanu din Torah, because they went according to the letter of the law. Reuven, you're right. Shimon, you're wrong. You win, you lose. You know what that did? The enmity, the hatred between the two litigants continued. He won and he lost. How does it feel to lose? What should they have done? Try before the trial begins to ask them, are you willing to compromise? Are you willing to reach something that will make the two of you happy, some sort of agreement before we go to trial, before we judge according to the letter of the law? It's not always good to go according to the mishpat, even though it's correct when you have no other choice. That's what the two want. But try to make peace between them. That's even more important than who's right and who's wrong. We'll figure that out too. But try to make them be friends again. Let them shake hands. Let them embrace. Otherwise, what you have instead, you're right and he's wrong. You win, you lose. And that is why the sinat hinam, the baseless hatred, continued and was perpetuated. And then Bet HaMidash was destroyed. So that's why he says, there's two things here, there's mishpat and there's tzedek. But don't leave me to the oppressors. Oppressors, even though that's the translation over here, it's not necessarily the best word. It means that there's a lot of people out there who are not honest, who are liars, who are abusive, corrupt. I think corrupt covers all of these. People who simply are not righteous in their ways, in their beliefs. And even though they appear to be observant, they appear to be religious, that's just appearances. There's no integrity in them. You see, we have to remember that a lot of people might do certain things properly, correctly, according to the Torah, but when it comes to money and business, they're, they're criminals. They're not just not honest, they're actually criminals. And he says, I'm worried about that. They may lie to me. They may not be truthful. And I don't want to you know, God forbid, make a mistake. That's number one. I don't want to make a mistake as a result of people who are lying, especially if they swear falsely, that's even worse. So that's partially what he means by not leaving me to the, these kind of people, oppressors, who may take advantage of me, thinking that perhaps I don't know any better, perhaps I'm naive, so he asks for help, and we're going to elaborate a little bit more later on in another pasuk that says something similar. Next pasuk, Kuf Chav Bet, 122. You see here, Al Yashkuni Zedim? That's what I was talking about. So what's the word Arov? Usually Arov means a cosigner, and Avon is a collateral. Sometimes it means something that's sweet. I'm going to go with the simple meaning, assuming that that's what he means over here. Arov means guarantee, from the word Aravon, collateral. So assuming that that is the translation over here, Arov Avdechal Etov means guarantee your servant goodness. Ali Ashkuni Zedim. Then don't let the wicked, here the word Zedim means wicked, bad people, don't let them exploit me. That would be a good word for Yashkuni. Even though we said before, Oshekai means oppressors, you're seeing the idea that we're talking about people who take advantage, people who exploit. And what could happen here if the judge makes a mistake? 
he may be responsible. He may have to pay from his pocket, depending on the circumstances. So there's several problems over here. He doesn't want to be lied to, he doesn't want to be exploited, so that he should not make a mistake in general about the case. He wants to be truthful, he's after the truth. Plus, he doesn't want to lose out because he's nice, just because he's fair. A lot of times people take advantage of people who they think are naive, who don't know any better. We have to pray, Hashem, protect us from all these people. And that is what the rabbis did, did tell us, did warn us. Be respectful of everyone, be suspicious. You're going to make an agreement, do it in writing. Never take a chance, the guy may forget. Even though he's not wicked, he may forget. What if he dies and you go to the children, your dad owes me money? He didn't tell us, always have it in writing. So we're dealing with here with potential zedim, wicked people. But then there are people who are not wicked necessarily, but, oh, I forgot. When did you say you lent me money? <laughs> you know what I mean? So you don't want to take a chance. So here as a judge, he's definitely concerned about wicked people out there. He doesn't want to lose out. He doesn't want to make a mistake. Next verse, Kufchab Gima 123. So here he goes back to remind us how he longed, he, he loved the Torah so much, he loved the mitzvot, he loved the relationship with Hashem, it meant a lot to him. So the translation here is approximately, my eyes long, kalu, lishuatecha for your salvation, ulimratzitkecha and for the word of your righteousness, which means your promise. So what exactly is he longing for? And anticipating and looking forward to. That Hashem should send him a Yeshua, a salvation. Not in one particular area, but in all areas. Remember, he's a king, he's a judge, he's a father. There's many responsibilities. We need Hashem's help in all these areas. Every single one of those areas are important. Raising children, judging. I mean, so we can't assume that we're going to always do the right thing if we rely on our mind, because who are we? We're frail, we're forgetful, we don't know everything, we don't have x-ray vision to be able to see who's telling the truth and who's not. Rabbis tell us, therefore, en la dayan ela The judge only can go by what his eyes can see, his physical eyes. But how much do they see? So we need to pray. The, the judge has to pray, besides being honest, besides being knowledgeable of the halakha, of the, of the laws, we have to pray. And that is partially what he's asking for. Yeshua, salvation in all areas. I'm looking forward, always lo longing that you should be on my side. Which basically means that I should not make mistakes, that I should succeed, that people should like me, not hate me. That too. Well, obviously, you, you have to know how to behave, how to conduct yourself, and how to deal with people. Human relationship is really an art. But part of it also has to do with Hashem giving you the gift of metziat chen, finding favor in people's eyes. So you have to be a nice guy. You have to do the right thing, however. Not to flatter, just to be nice. To do the right thing, but that Hashem should give you the chen that you need, that people should look up to you, respect you, and so forth. So that's partially what he's asking for because of this responsibility that he has, dealing with tough people, dealing with wicked people. He could easily make enemies, and he actually did make many enemies for all kinds of reasons. So he's longing, looking forward to Hashem's promise, to Hashem's Yeshua, that Hashem will take care of him, protect him, and guide him. All right, next verse, next pasuk, Kuf Chaf Dalet, 124. Treat your servant according to your kindness and teach me your statutes. According to your kindness, why? Why kindness? Because sometimes people don't deserve. You know, it was based on their lack of observance, perhaps, based on the fact that they made many mistakes. Maybe they might not deserve that Hashem should protect them and help them. After all, we're talking about divine assistance. To receive that divine assistance, you do need zechuyot. You do merits, you need to pray, you just can't assume Hashem will always be there for you. You have to deserve it. So he says, even if I don't deserve it, perhaps I did something wrong. Yeah, that can happen, we're only human, we make mistakes, we all make mistakes. 
Hashem, please, you're kind. Kindness is even to those who don't deserve it. You see, it pays to pray. <laughs> if these are the words that we use to communicate with Hashem, Hashem, be kind to us, He will listen if we mean those words. So He's sharing with us examples of beautiful words, powerful words, of what He used. He used, He said these words to Hashem. And He wrote it down for us. Pray that Hashem should be kind to you just in case you don't have enough merits. That's the second half of the verse. And teach me your statutes. Well, how should Hashem teach him statutes? Hashem is not a teacher per se, right? How will he teach him? So, when we learn halacha, when we learn Torah, we can sometimes misinterpret something. We can sometimes misunderstand something. Not everything is so crystal clear that we will understand it. He wants to be enlightened. So when he says, teach me, he means basically enlighten me, that I should have a clear understanding. What is it that you expect of me to do? What is the correct approach, the correct attitude that I need to have in this kind of way? How do I deal with tough people? How do you deal with a tough child? Do you just kick him out of the home? God forbid, no, no, definitely not. They need a lot of love. How do we know that? Well, the Torah basically says that, that you have to be very careful. You have to refuse. Sometimes you have to say no. Unfortunately, we sometimes have to say no. Yes, if it's wrong, but he's asking, Dad, give me this. No. But if you said no with your left hand, with the weaker hand, then use your right hand to embrace him and hug him. Small docha v'yimin mekarevet, the rabbi says. You've got to use both hands, the left, the weaker hand, to refuse to say no, the right to embrace and to show your, your love for him, that you're not just refusing him, it's for his own good that you're refusing. You have to have both. So we need guidance for this. So that's somewhat what David Amelech has in mind here. Hashem, teach me, your statutes teach me what is the right thing. What do I apply in this, in this particular case? Kuf Hei 125. Avdecha Ani habineni vedea edotecha. I'm your servant. Grant me understanding that I may know your testimonies. Okay. I'm your servant. Well, isn't that obvious? What is he teaching us over here? By telling us that he's a servant of Hashem, he's saying, I want to do this right because I'm your servant. I want to serve you properly. This is not for my own dignity and for my own kavod. I realize that I cannot do a good job without your help. We need something called in Aramaic siyata dishmaya, divine help, help from above. So I need your help. I'm your servant. I want to do the right thing. So havineni, havineni here is not to teach, but to give me, to grant me understanding. It's not just about raw knowledge, it's to understand. Okay, this is exactly what happened. I understand what happened, but what happened before, what happened after? In other words, there's a lot more to a particular problem that arises. If we need to figure out what to do and who's right and who's wrong, there's a lot that needs to be figured out if we don't have enough witnesses or we can't rely on them. So we need bina. Bina means understanding. So what do I do now? How do I figure this out? What are the questions that I'm going to ask? Ve'edeha as a result of that bina, so that I should understand or know your testimonies. In other words, which law to apply. We talk about here all kinds of laws. There's all kinds of laws in the Torah between neighbors, boss and his employee, issues that come up, husband and wife. Give me therefore the Bina, grant me that understanding that I need to be able to resolve these issues properly. Why? Because Avdecha, I mean, I'm your servant. Not just anybody, I want to do the right thing, I want to do it for your sake, not for me. That's why he's using the word Avdecha, and we're going to come back to that several times. He's going to focus on the importance of doing it for Hashem's sake, not for us. We want Him to be happy with us. 
you know, sometimes people don't want to make a mistake, they don't want to be embarrassed. No, that's not what this is all about over here. This is more about doing the right thing in order to please Hashem. Kuf Chavav 126. This is a famous pasuk, a famous verse. Et la asod la Adonai heferu Toratecha. There are several interpretations of this verse, 126. It is time to act for Hashem. They have abrogated. I think that's the best translation. They have abrogated your Torah. They went against it. Well, what exactly is it telling us? It's a time to do for Hashem. When is that time to do to Hashem? It says, So simple, simply stated, as a result of them abrogating, as a result of so many people abrogating, going against, not doing what the Torah says, this is the time to do for Hashem. This is the best time. This is a propitious time. If Hashem sees everybody or a lot of people are abrogating, letting go, and comes along this gentleman and does what the Torah says, he gets a tremendous amount of credit for it. Wow, he's going against the trend. Everybody's abrogating and he's going ahead with it. So, et la sot Hashem dafka, specifically when is it a time to do it? When everybody else is not doing it. Don't join the gang. So you stand out, so what? Remember, this is the time Hashem is waiting to see Mila Shem Eli, who's on Hashem's side, who's in his camp. That's one interpretation. Another idea is when we're talking about et la sot Hashem, we're talking about Hashem plans for the wicked, what he plans as far as retribution. There will be a time, there is an eighth a time for Hashem that he will carry out justice. And when does that happen? When Heferu Torah Techa, when there's an abrogation of Torah. But it's not only Torah, it's also when there's certain cardinal sins being committed all over the place. And from time to time you hear of major disasters, and we don't always know the reasons for them, but it's it's against the laws of nature, against the laws of Hashem. Certain things that happen, Hashem doesn't just let large areas of the world be destroyed, and thousands of people to be killed for nothing. So this is partially insinuated here and in other verses that there is justice, and from time to time there's an it, there's a time that this is carried out. So this is the second interpretation, there's one more. There could be various, but we're only going to cover one more interpretation. There are times, believe it or not, et la sot Hashem, it's a time to do for Hashem, even though what we're about to do is a fero Torah Techa, is to go against the, what the Torah says. For example, one example that is quoted is Eliyahu Navi Eliyahu, the prophet, when he brought a sacrifice on an altar that was not at the temple. That was a time that it was a suit, it was prohibited for him to bring a sacrifice on a bama, on an altar, a private altar, an altar outside of Jerusalem in Harakamim. But he had to do that. That was an exception. There are exceptions when you have to prove to the people who are lost, who are doing the wrong things, God exists. You want to see? I'm going to prove it to you. If you read that chapter about the famous Eliyahu Navi with the false prophets, where he proved that Hashem, everybody said, Hashem wa Elohim, God is the real God, not the idols. So he did that for Hashem's sake. He did it to sanctify Hashem's name. So this is also included in this verse, that there is et la sot Hashem, sometimes we do something for Hashem, and because that's what we want to accomplish, it may involve doing something against the Alecha, very rarely. But there is something similar to that, and that is, for example, where well, we have to do something that is prohibited to do on Shabbat, but to save a person's life. So we're doing a mitzvah that is definitely a very important mitzvah that allows us to not do away completely, I don't want to use the word do away, but to not comply with the halacha of Shabbat. You can do it Shabbat, you're not allowed to drive, you're not allowed to do all kinds of things on Shabbat. But this person's life is in danger. So we know, we know that when a person's life is in danger, we're allowed to do a lot of things, even though they may be prohibited. You give him to eat something that's not kosher. If you need to, he's dying of hunger. He needs it. He needs the medication. Right? So that is somewhat similar to this, but on a different scale. 
All right, next verse. Kuf Chavzayin 127. This one is easy to translate. Therefore, I love your commandments more than gold and even fine gold. That's the difference between Zahav and Paz. There's different grades of gold. Rabbis discuss it a little bit. How there's slightly different colors. One is more reddish, one is more yellow. It's interesting. So that's why you have here two different kinds of words for gold. But he says that his love for the Torah, his love for the mitzvot, is greater than gold. Well, <laughs> he's told us something similar before. So what is he adding over here? Look at the connection. Always sometimes when you can't figure out what he's saying, try to see what he said before. And sometimes that context enables you to understand what he's saying in the next pasuk. He was talking about in the previous pasuk about Eferu Torah Techa, how there's so many people who just abrogated, in other words, who let go, who were disconnected from Torah. What a shame. He says, I better do something about it. I will show everyone how much I love this. I will show them by example how this is more precious and more special than gold. You're not taking the gold with you when you go to the grave. You won't take it with you. But the Torah and the mitzvot, you will. Obviously, you're going to have smart alecks who are going to tell you, what do you mean? There is an afterlife? You're going somewhere? Did ever anybody come back from there? How do you know that there's an afterlife? That's the, that's the way they begin the argument, the discussion with you. Did anybody ever come back from there? And your answer will be, yeah, of course. I have even regards from there. <laughs> you know, and, and you get him interested. Yeah, who sent you regards? So, uh, People have had an NDE, near-death experience. They've seen so many things going on upstairs. There's real dreams of people who have left this world, who have come and have said what they've said. There's enough evidence, even though it's not scientific, you want to call it, so what? It's just impossible to disprove all these people having real dreams, these, all these NDE experiences, and many people all over the world have had millions of people. It's just not possible that they all saw similar things. They're not even related and speak to each other. What is it? But these are just two quick examples. There's a lot more that proves that, there, of course, there's an afterlife. So once you begin to tell these people, listen, you're doing a disfavor to yourself by wasting your time in this world, pursuing all these vanities, right? There's a lot more important things in life than just gold and silver and money. But that's what the evil inclination does. It distracts you and makes you believe this is the most valuable thing. You'll become a billionaire one day. Really? They don't even know that if the mazal is not with the person, he can take 10 jobs and he'll never make it even to his first million if he doesn't have mazal. Oh, what's mazal? There's such a thing as mazal, yeah? If you don't have that mazal, you won't make even one million. Not even close to that. You can try all day long and all night nothing will happen. So a lot of people lack all this knowledge. They don't, don't have this knowledge and therefore the Bible says, I have to show them that I love it. I appreciate it. Not only for me, not only that, that he demonstrates to Hashem that he loves it, but also to others since there's so many who unfortunately have fed Torah Techa, they've abrogated the Torah, they don't even realize it, what they're, what they're giving up. Next verse. This is the last one of the letter Ayn. 128. Therefore, I affirm all your precepts. Pikudei call your precepts. I have hated every path of, of falsehood. Well, since he uses the word alken, this too tells us that this is somewhat connected to the previous Pesukim. What happened in the previous Pesukim? We said that. Some people simply let go, stopped keeping them. So they may have kept it at one time, but they stopped. People sometimes go off the derech, they go off the path. It happens. They're disappointed, they're upset, they have issues. He says, I need to do something about it if I can. What is that? Yisharti. Yisharti means to straighten them. When he says that I affirmed all your precepts, to affirm here means to take it into my hand 
and somehow bring it to their attention how this will help them, how this will straighten their life, how this makes so much sense for them. That's why he uses it, the word here, Yishati, to straighten out, even though it's being translated by some as to affirm. But it's not so much that you are affirming it as much as you are straightening them out, helping them understand that they are mistaken in their way. So I take all these precepts and use them to teach them this is the way you should conduct yourself. Look, this is the way you should do it. Be like that and your life will be more successful. You'll be happier. You'll be more successful at home as a husband, as a father. Follow this path because they're not following the right path. So this, I, I think this is very, very significant here. Just because you're doing something right doesn't mean that you should be so proud of yourself if you know people who are your relatives who you could perhaps help because they're not going in the right path. And that is why he adds the words at the end, Kol orach sheke saneti, I can't tolerate, I can't take it, that all these paths are false. They're so false. There's so much fake news, right? Everybody's complaining about that these days. I can't take it. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to teach them the right path. Let them, therefore, after they hear this, compare. And let them see for themselves. All right. We can go on now to pay, the letter pay, 129. Your testimonies are pelaot. Pelaot means wondrous. Therefore, does my soul guard them. Wondrous. What does what does that really say? Wondrous. What's so wondrous about the mitzvot? You see how he's talking about mitzvot, one pasuk after another about the Torah, but he's saying something else in every verse. Pelaot. Wondrous means that there's so much wisdom to the mitzvot. They're wondrous. They're incredible. They're not just human laws, they're divine. And if you were to study them, not just to observe them, if you were to study a little bit about them, you would see how much depth they have, how they can really be helpful. If people would learn about them, it's what properly, hopefully they would adapt them, and they would apply it in their life, and they would see for themselves how this helps them. This is what the Vilom Melech is trying to say in this Pesukim, that he tried, I'm sure, with many people, who were not doing the right thing, who were following falsehood, to straighten them out by here, adapt to this mitzvah, and you will see how much good it will do for you, how you will be blessed, how you'll be happier. So he says it's pelaot. If you really learned it, you will see how wondrous they are. That's the simple translation of pelaot. But because they're wondrous, al kenet saratam nafshi. Therefore, my soul guards them. I don't want to let go of them. I see how they're meaningful. Neither should you. How could you remember? He's going back to what he was saying before. How could you have abrogated? How could you have left this? What did you choose instead? As the prophet says, you know what some Jews chose instead? Borot nishbarim, empty wells. You had water. And you went after empty wells, the idols. What are you replacing this with that for? Imagine, <laughs> it's, it's funny but it's sad, imagine somebody who's married to the most beautiful woman, kind, charitable, righteous, God-fearing, and he goes and, and divorces her and takes somebody who is not as good at all, bad, no God-fearing, not as good-looking, for some reason, we don't know why, we don't know, but this happens. This happens, and people let go. Now, sometimes people let go because they're really suffering. Of course, they get divorced, and the second person maybe is nicer to them. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when they let go something that was beautiful and special. And you say to yourself, he chose that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we don't understand. Now, if this is the first time he's getting married, it is okay to say, you know, I have no clue how come he chose her. 
but beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. <laughs> to him she is beautiful. But to let go something that, according to everyone, is righteous and special, a woman of valor, and to replace it with something so inferior, that doesn't make any sense. But people sometimes make ridiculous mistakes. So it says, the Torah is pelaot, it's wondrous. How could you let go of it? Just try it out. I held it dearly and close to me all the time because of that. Some say pelaot does mean conceal. That is concealed. We don't even know all that there is to know about it. And therefore, I delved into it a lot, as much as I can. But because it was concealed, I realized that there was a limit to what I could know. But I still did it. I still kept it close to myself. Perhaps another reason why he would say this about the mitzvot is because there are mitzvot that are big as far as the reward, and there are some that are less. In other words, you will be rewarded for all of them, but we don't know which ones are bigger and smaller. As my mom this points out, be careful. You can't judge yourself which one is bigger. It might be what you think is a small mitzvah, but it happens to be that it's a very big mitzvah. What you think is a big mitzvah may not be such a big mitzvah. So therefore, he says, it's pelaot. A lot of it is hidden or concealed from us concerning the mitzvot. Keep them all. Don't try to say this one is big and this one is small. We're only going to do the big ones. You don't know which ones are bigger. They're all important. Next verse, Kuflam at 130. Petach yair mevin petayim. Your opening words, petach, opening, the running words. Your opening words illuminate, yair, enlightening the simple. Okay, your opening words are enlightening, they illuminate. Yes, what that means is that when you begin from Bereshit, which you may say are those opening words of the Torah, they will illuminate you will get a good understanding of what's going on, that first and foremost, Hashem created the world. You could say that too. I'm not sure that 100% that that is the only interpretation here, but that does make some sense. Petach Devarecha, your opening words, which ones? It could be in the Bereshit. However, the commentaries do tell us that when one begins to learn Torah, so the opening words of his learning will illuminate him the light of the Torah will shine upon him. Torah does have a light of sorts. It shines. It not only shines on the person, it makes his countenance shine. If he's really devoted to it, that is on a spiritual level that we do not necessarily see. But it does shine in a way that he himself will realize, wow, the Torah has done so much for me, it gave me clarity, it enlightened me. So he says, you don't have to wait long. Petar Devarim, even the opening words, will illuminate and enlighten the simple. People who are not so learned necessarily. If they only taste it, if they only get started, they will realize it. So don't think that you need a PhD in Torah <laughs> to be able to master it and, and gain something from it. Even the beginning words, a lot of people who were far from Torah, who eventually did Teshuvah, they came back, especially in Israel, I heard many stories. As soon as they got immersed in Gemara, wow, a whole world opened up that they did not know existed. Wow, such great analysis, such depth, such wisdom. They were impressed. Yes, it will illuminate, it will enlighten. Yes, if you learn Kabbalah, the Sodot, you will be even more illuminated. But you don't need the Kabbalah. That's why he's saying Petach Devari, even the very beginning, the first words, the basics, will illuminate, will enlighten the simple. Next Pasuk. Pi fa'arti vaish'afa ki ya'afti. I open my mouth. The next one is a little interesting. Vaish'afa. It basically means, and I swallowed. Even though it really means more like, I took in a deep breath. It's the same idea. I took it in, I absorbed it. 
I opened my mouth and I absorbed all this Torah. Ki lemisotecha ya'afti. Because I craved your commandments. So look at the words he uses here. He uses crave. So that's why he began to say, I opened my mouth. Because when do you open your mouth? When you crave something, you want to eat something that's tasty. So you see why he uses crave and opening of the mouth. But why say it in that way? What for? Very significant point here. There are many people who, Baruch Hashem, observe mitzvot and learn Torah. They show an interest. But they're not necessarily eager to perform the mitzvah. They're obligated. It's a sense of duty that they have. They understand it's important. They want to be rewarded for it. That's fine. Here he's talking about a whole different level. And to better understand what it means that I crave for this, I realize my life depends on this, just like my life depends on food and air. I, I would like to use the example of tzedakah. When you learn about the laws of tzedakah, you will see that there are various levels of tzedakah. There's the level of a person who gives tzedakah when he's asked to give. That's very nice of you. Somebody asked you, and you gave him. But what about if you don't wait for him to ask you and you go looking for him? Imagine you're looking for the poor man. Who needs money here? Who needs help? I'd like to help. That's a much higher level. I just gave you two examples. There are more. There are different levels of just this mitzvah called tzedakah, how people do it. So the example of the individual looking for the poor man is definitely a real example of someone who craves for the mitzvah. He doesn't have to do it. Have to? No obligation. Of course it's a mitzvah. I want to do it. I love it. You don't see this, unfortunately, too much. It exists. It does exist. You have different levels. Some people are easy going about it. Some people are very stingy. Some people have a hard time with it. Some people will give a, give a little. You know, it, it's, it's just depending on the person, depending on how much he values the mitzvah. So he says, look, this is what I did. When it came to mitzvot, when it came to learn Torah, I craved for it. I wanted to swallow it. I looked for the opportunity. A whole different level. A different experience. And this is what he wants us to learn, of course, because this is the highest level, in a sense. When one gets closer to doing things for the sake of Hashem, not for his own personal gain. He loves the mitzvah. He wants to do it. He realizes that this is important. Next verse. Kuflam in Ben 132. Turn to me and favor me. As in your law for those who love your name. So here he's asking a favor from Hashem. What's the favor? Hashem, since I demonstrated how much I love the mitzvot, since I reached that level of craving it, please. I ask that you reciprocate in kind. You see how this is a, con a continuation. I ask Pene Eli, turn to me and show that you want me, that you're interested in me. Honeni, favor me. Kemishpat, as is your law for those who love you or who love your name. In other words, Midakinegmina, measure for measure. I demonstrated such love, such interest. Please, show me the same. Not that he's begging here, not that he's saying it's coming to me. He's just saying, this is what's coming, isn't it? This is what is due according to your mishpat. This is the way it should be. But please, don't let anything interfere with that. There are all kinds of accusations, all kinds of things that may interfere with how strong the connection between us and Hashem is, whether He accepts, listens to our prayers or not. He says, Hashem, not that you forgot, but remember, or take this into consideration, I have shown sincerity, I have shown sensitivity, I have shown love for the mitzvot, for the Torah, for, for people, human beings, but please reciprocate that. So He's asking, rightfully so, because Hashem wants us to pray to Him. 
So what are we going to say? This is what are we going to say if we really can say those words. I don't know how many people can say it, but he said what he said over here because that's the way he conducted himself. Next verse, he explains this a little bit better. Also very significant. In this verse, really says a lot of what we've been talking about. 133. Set my steps in your word. Pe'amai are the steps. And let no iniquity rule over me. Well, to set his steps, what does that mean? Guide me. That everything should be on the right path, according to Imratecha, according to your word. And don't let any iniquity, Avin, get in the way. The goal here is, David Amir says, I want to succeed in doing a mitzvah, not only because it's a mitzvah, but because I want to do it with Hashem Shabbat. I want to do it 100%. I want it to be pure. And I don't want anything to interfere with that. So therefore, I ask that you take my steps, guide them, that they should only only want to do imratecha. See what I mean? I don't do it for myself. It's not for me. I want to do it for you. I want to merit one day that I do this mitzvah 100%. But there may be some things that can get in the way. What kind of things? Hafraot they're called in Hebrew. All kinds of things that will disturb you. One of those, the commentaries tell us, is the Yetzer Allah himself. Aven over here, iniquity, is referring to the evil inclination to don't let him get in the way to distract me, to interrupt me, to cool me off, to discourage me, to depress me. Yes, all of this can come from Yetzirah easily. Don't let that happen. Don't let it. Pray for it. It's not automatic. Hashem is going to be there for you and help you if you ask for it. And if you prove that you really mean what you're saying. That you want to try your best, okay, you want to try your best, I'll help you. So that's one interpretation of Avin Yitzhak. The other interpretation is that it's referring to all kinds of disruptions that are out there, that they should not get in the way. Okay, so far so good, but there's one more powerful idea that the Bila Melech expresses concerning interruptions, and that is in the next pasuk, the next verse, 134. Flamedalet, 134. Pedeni me adam Deliver me from the oppression of man. Oshek here, oppression, but it really means also the robbing. And I'll explain in a minute. Deliver me from those kinds of problems. Oppression of man, and I will keep your precepts. So the goal here is to keep your pikudecha. The real goal is that they should be done without pniyot, without any personal gain or interest. All right, we've covered that. So what exactly is pedeni mehoshek adam? Pedeni means deliver me or save me or spare me. Oshek reminds us here that one of the things that really, really interferes and robs and sometimes frustrates our best intentions and plans is the waste of time. The waste of time is what the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, which is Oshek Adam, by the way, is referring to the evil inclination too. It's not just man, human beings. The evil inclination will rob you of that precious asset called time. There's only so much time in life. And if we waste it on things that are totally unimportant and not necessary, what a, what a waste. Hashem, help me. Deliver me from that kind of an Oshek, the Oshek of time. I want to keep your misword. I want to keep all of them. I don't want to miss out. Again, pray for it. Don't assume it's going to happen automatically because there are interruptions, all kinds, besides phone calls, <laughs> besides paying bills. I'm not talking about those things. There's things that are unexpected, and many of them coming from the direction of the evil inclination. Oshik, he will rob you of that time. He will distract you. I shall help you with that because I want to observe your mitzvot. I don't want to miss any one of them because of that. Sometimes mitzvot come your way, and if you didn't do them on time, they're gone. Next pasuk. Panecha ha'er be'avdecha ve'lamdeni et chukecha. 
Kuflam et Hei 135. Let your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. This is also significant. He's talking about here Maor Panim. You know, it was let your face shine upon me. A lot of people don't understand what does it mean that Hashem's face shines. They think it just means Hashem blesses you. Yes, in a, in a way it is true, but it's more than that. When one is learning Torah and is having a hard time, it is a good idea to pray, Hashem, enlighten me, shine your face on me so that I should understand. A lot of rabbis who sometimes had a hard time understanding a Gemara, a Halakha, they pray, they cry to Hashem, and all of a sudden they were enlightened. Hashem's light or face shined on them. That is partially what he's asking for over here. Shine. What, what for? So that I can understand. Sometimes it's difficult for me to figure out my learning the interpretation of something in the Torah, the mitzvah. That's why he says, and teach me your statue. In other words, I want you to teach me how by shining your face at me. Okay, the last verse of Pei. Palge maim yardu einaya lo shamaru toratecha. 136. My eyes shed streams of water because they do not keep your Torah. Here he's already referring to all those individuals who we said before that were not keeping. I feel bad for them, he says. Don't think I'm upset at them. God forbid I'm not going to curse them. <laughs> no. What is the correct attitude? I shed tears for them. I feel bad for them. Therefore, I hope through my prayers and the way I feel that I will get them to awaken. Very important idea too. A lot of people just ignore, don't care. Let them do what they want. No, no, no. These are our brothers, human beings, people who are going through sorrow, people who went through some terrible experience. We have to feel bad and help them out if we can. They don't have to be your family. They don't have to be of the same religion. So what? Feel bad for these people because they're ignorant. They don't know any better. Many of them, it's not their fault. So here we're not necessarily talking about the wicked, but even those that are wicked, pray that they should one day not be wicked. Tzadi, now we begin with the letter Tzadi. Pasuk Kuf Lamed Zayin 137. Tzadi katav moebi Righteous, Hashem is righteous, Hashem. And your judgments are upright. Okay, that we know, Hashem is righteous and His judgments are upright. So what exactly is he revealing to us over here? Imagine a woman whose husband was caught and is now being sent to jail for 25 years. And she goes over to the judge. Judge, it's totally unfair that I should be a living widow and my kids living orphans. Did you consider them in putting him away for 25 years? And the judge says, what can I do? That's the law of the land. He committed a terrible crime and the penalty is 25 years in jail. Hashem is not like that. That's immortal. You king, that's a mortal judge. Hashem takes everything into account. If the woman, the kids don't deserve the pain, Hashem will not do that to the husband, to the man. You know, even though he's wrong, even though he's wicked, he did terrible things, he may give him a certain amount of years just because the wife and the kids don't deserve it. That is a small example that I just gave you of what he talks about over here when he says that it's all just, it's all righteous. Hashem is a tzaddik, v'yashar mishpatecha. His judgments, his statutes, they're all righteous, they're all just, they're upright. Next pasuk, tzivita et tzedek edotecha v'muna me'od, kuf lam 138. You commanded your testimonies in righteousness and great faithfulness. Also, similar idea. In the same way that Hashem is just in His ways, His mitzvot are just as well. That's why He says over here that Tzedek Edotecha, He commanded and instructed what kind of a mitzvot? Mitzvot are Tzedek. Ve'emunah me'od. And of course, with the ultimate goal of strengthening our emunah and our connection to Him. As we will soon see, the mitzvot have various goals, various things that they accomplish when we observe them. It's not just knowledge. It's 
so that we should be guided in doing the right thing. It's not just about rewarding the world to come. It does something to us. But before we cover that, soon, here he's talking about that just like Hashem is like that, in his way and how he conducts himself with all creatures, in a just way, in a righteous way, the same is true with all his mitzvot. They're fair. They're upright. And, of course, not only do they strengthen the Munah, the goal here is that one should do them be Munah. One should do them with complete faith. One should do them for the sake of Hashem. That is also the word Emunah. It strengthens our faith. It is ultimately to connect us to Hashem, but also that we remember to do them for the sake of Hashem. Next verse. Simetat nikinati ki shachechu. The Barech at Sarai, 139. My zeal consumes me because my enemies have forgotten your words. My zeal consumes me. I feel bad, upset, not because I'm upset, but because of what they have done. You know, it was Hashem, I'm upset for you. I'm not jealous for me or anything. My zeal is for your sake. So he uses the word simetatni, very strong word over here. My zeal consumes me that they have forgotten your words, that they're not observing your Torah mitzvah. Similar to what he said about before. And this is what the wife of Rabbi Meir told him, Bruria, who had bad neighbors who were troublemakers. Don't pray, my dear husband, for their demise. I know you're upset at them. Pray that they should return. Pray that they should do Teshuvah. And one day they did. <laughs> you never know how far your prayers can go. So be patient with these people, pray for them, not that they should, God forbid, die, but that they should change their ways. I feel bad for them, and I feel bad that they've left you. I'm consumed by that. My zeal is for you, he's saying. Next verse. That's the one I was talking about, how the Torah does something else that is very special. 140, Kuf Mem. Your word is very pure and your servant cherishes it. Tserufa means pure. It's complete. It's not lacking anything. It's just right. That's the simple meaning. But Tserufa also means letzaref. It refines us. All the words of the Torah, all the mitzvot that we do, it does something for us, for our character. Look what the mitzvot do. That's what he's saying. It's Tserufa. It's so pure. It does so much to the neshama. So he's saying that the word Tserufa should remind us that the mitzvot are not lacking anything. They're perfect, they're complete. And they do so much for us, they purify us. A lot of people may think that there's mistakes in the Torah. No, it's tzerufa, it's complete, it's not lacking anything. This is a perfect Torah. If you follow that, you would see. Next pasuk. Pasuk Kufman Me'alev, Tzagir Anuchi V'Nivze Pikudecha Lo Shachachti, 141. I am young and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Here he's talking about himself. He said this in different words many times, even though he was despised, even though he was young. He kept up. He did not forget the mitzvot. He didn't mind what they did to him. He continued on. He showed tremendous courage in the face of all kinds of challenges, regardless of his age, regardless of what he was going through, even though he was nivze, he was put down so many times. He did not forget the mitzvah, he kept on observing it in all kinds of circumstances. People may go through this. Sometimes people are made fun of. Listen, David Amalek went through a lot of hardships and he didn't forget the Torah. Next pasuk, Tzitkatechat Sere Le'olam Torah 142. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your Torah is truth. It's everlasting. The Torah does not change. The mitzvot do not change. Hashem's ways do not change. The Torah is true all the time. It doesn't need to be reformed by all kinds of movements who want to reform the Torah. It's all true. It's true the way it is. You can't add to it. It will therefore be forever. Just like Hashem's righteousness is forever, Le'olam, so is the Torah. It's the same Torah that will always be. It will not be changed. Even though when Mashiach comes, there will be certain things that will be taught to us that we don't have now, but that's something else. Next, Pasuk. Tzaru Matzok Metzaoni Mitzvotecha Shashuai 143. 
Trouble and anguish have taken hold of me, yet the commandments are my delight. He's reminding us what the Torah did for him, even though he was in trouble, even though he was in pain, even though he was in all kinds of difficult situations. It's not only that he kept on observing them, they were actually shashuai. They were my delight. They helped him. They uplifted his spirits. Look what I gained from observing the mitzvah. Look what I gained by learning Torah. It always helped me out. Even though he was in trouble and he was in deep trouble, he was helped by the Torah. It was a complete delight. It gave him so much motivation. It uplifted his spirits. Last verse. Tzedek et votecha leolam avinine vechyeh 144. Your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. It is through the mitzvot, your testimonies. They are righteous forever. It is through them that we gain our ticket to Olam about to the world to come. Therefore, allow me to understand it as best as possible because, because I realize that Yavira says that the more I understand, the more I observe it perfectly, the more I invest effort in it, the more my reward will be. The reward is according to one's effort, the rabbis tell us. The more one invests, the more one learns, the more he will not only know, the greater his reward will be in Olam Abba. So basically that's how he ends the chapter over here. I want to live. What do you mean to live? To live in the world to come. It's not just about a temporary transitory life over here. That life, that eternal life, of course we all will God willing have a share to it, but some people's share will be greater. And a lot will have to do with how much effort did we apply to it. Yes.